In keeping with the theme, um, I'll see the stage here, the Greek stage here is sort of, I see my job as sort of being the mythical phoenix, sort of the champion that is interested in taking an organization, crashing a core competency into the ground and reinventing something new. So that's what I sort of do. My boss is Undersecretary Cohen for Department of Homeland Security, Science and Technology. He has a budget of about $1 billion a year. He runs a program called HS ARPA, which is a counterpart to DARPA. And in, in that budget of a billion, we take 10% and dedicate it to um, disruptive innovations. And Admiral Cohen told, or Secretary Cohen told Congress, that out of one out of 10, out of every one of those innovations successful, he thinks that's success. If two out of 10 were successful, he considered it failure because he wasn't stretching our ideas far enough. So what are some of those ideas we're looking at? We're looking at things like um, how to take a hurricane, put a force shock into the middle of it, and have it go a different vector, get inside of a tornado, either dissipate it or something else. And then we have some other projects down the road like that. So Undersecretary Cohen's a champion of these. My job sits outside of that organization. My title to him is I'm the disruptive innovator for him. I, so I have a direct reporting chain to him. So I sit right beyond the boundary of when we start to fund things and new things that are coming in. Last year at BIF, Undersecretary Cohen and I were extremely impressed with the younger generation and their stories. In fact, we spent a couple hours talking about it later. And today, I think yesterday we heard Gary and Steve talk about Best Buy. And if you can see their enthusiasm, they got up, they did something new, it was about social networking. So when we got done, we decided to do something about this because we thought we were missing out on some innovation that might help Homeland Security or Department of Defense. So we started what we called a disruptive innovation group out at the Air Force Academy. We chose the Air Force Academy for a couple reasons. Everybody there is 4,000 cadets. Everyone's a science and technology major, or they get a bachelor of science degree. And they have some leading edge technologies when we do some research. The second purpose was it was far enough away from Rome or DC that it wasn't involved in all the defense contractors or big companies that exist. So we could spin outside. Third reason, it was located close to NORTHCOM, Northern Command, which is a Department of Defense organization that looks at defense. So we are the Department of Homeland Security, a different department, but then we can, we can do some things there. So at the Air Force Academy, what we're doing is something very interesting, and earlier David talked about it. We are interested there in um, looking at new innovations and taking 4,000 cadets from ages 18 to 22, some of the elite students in our nation, and they do social networking. So when I, when I work with them, they come into my office, we sit down, they go, hey, Terry, you talk about social networking. We do social networking. And they spend most of their time and their geniuses at doing this, the systems, they get around doing new things that I never thought about we could use with web, like web 2.0, um, uh, streaming video and those type of things. So one day, um, last May, we were sitting there, and there's a guy by the name of Kirk, um, and Nick Fritz. Nick Fritz was graduating, getting ready. He's at Armed Forces Institute of Technology, getting a master's degree in cybersecurity. When he gets that in two years, he's going to work for the National Security Agency. There was Nick playing this game called Warcraft. So I come up to him and go, Nick, what are you playing this game Warcraft for? And he goes, well, I'm playing Warcraft because it's really fun. It's an online game. There's a bunch of people playing. And I go, well, isn't it kind of a waste of your time? And he goes, no, no, no. I go, well, you're trying to attack a dragon and gold in your dungeon and all that kind of stuff. And he goes, no, I don't play it for that. I play it to coordinate 16 to 17 other people on how to make a precise attack and to modulate that attack when we're doing it. So I got the idea. We went back to Undersecretary Cohen. And I said, hey, these guys are using social networking tools in a way that we never thought about using them. And the way that we look at using them is how do we take an organization, maybe like the Air Force Academy, or maybe like a war fighting unit, or maybe like our Homeland Security people, how do we create an elite network? How do we create elite fabric that everyone can publish into and then filter, as opposed to the way we do it now, we all all the information is filtered first, and it's published back to you. So out of that project we're working on, I've been working on for about a year, translating this capability of using social networking tools to create something called flexible distributed control. Flexible distributed control, what it does, we're creating a mesh fabric, 
that everyone can plug into, and the control itself is being handled in the routers themselves. Um, Cisco came to me a year ago and says, we have, a, we have human network routers that almost think they could, and suppose they take the seven layers, if you're familiar with the OSI model, all layers are blended, kind of hooked a computer on the router, so when any information goes through a router, instead of just reading the address where it should go, it reads everything instantaneously. When it does that, you can sit there and go, oh, a message that used was for Saul that came in from somebody else. The message says that we have a, you know, an O2 level that's low in our lunar module. Instead of just going to Saul, it gives it to me at the same time, or it gives it over to Doug or somebody else. We can read at the same time. So that is a capability that I looked at that Cisco had emerging out there saying, hey, we got this thing. We have a Klingon cloaking device. How do you want to use it? And they came to us and said, we have this capability, how do you want to use it? So what I do is I take those capabilities that people are doing, look at them, I write think tank papers on them, I go and talk to a bunch of different people like you who are innovators, and go, how would we use this for the defense of the country? How do we create an amber alert so when the war in Iraq ends and the first guy comes over here to you plan an IED in the Boston subway, how do we identify that person rapidly? And we use the whole collective to do that. So those are the type of things we're working on right now. And we're working at the Air Force Academy on. So we have cadets. We have 4,000 of them. We're using the social networking tools, which they're experts at, in ways of using things that, um, that we never thought about using. Here's a case study that we teach. And this will take about seven minutes to talk about. But it ties in everything and the problems that we face in Homeland Security and the Department of Defense. The case study is a liquid crystal display TV, 48 inch, 1080, 1080 pixel that you can buy today in your store. For full disclosure, I bought a Samsung 1080 pixel, 48 inch TV when I got into the research. But the research I did was on Sharp in Japan and how they did the information. We have a problem in the business side and we have a problem on the military and Homeland Security side. Typically the lead company or the lead warfighting unit or organization, we invent things, new radical things that we rarely use in a disruptive way. Tons of examples out there. We invented the machine gun in 1863, used it once in 1864 in the Mississippi. Custard left four of them behind in garrison before he went to Little Bighorn. The British used the machine gun seven years later in a war in South Africa and killed 30,000 people in 15 minutes. We, at the end of World War II, had B-29s. We had two nuclear bombs we dropped. We had another one we were almost finished building. And yet, and after the end of the war, we took half the German V-2 scientists. The Russians took the other half the V-2 scientists, no nuclear weapons, no long-range bombers. Nine years later, the Soviets, create the first ICBM weapon where they put a nuke inside of a missile that we can launch. Two years later, we accomplished the same feat. So this story goes over and over and over again. We build things that scientists tell us we have to use. We build GPS devices to put on ships so we know where they're supposed to go. We have somebody come up to me and say, hey, Terry, what if we put a GPS device on a dumb bomb? I go, oh, you can't do that. I invented this to go on ships so we know where they're located. And he said, no. So you see the stories. What we're looking for is how to use technology. We have plenty of technologies. We have a plenty of emerging technologies. We have plenty of advanced technologies. And we have plenty of disruptive technologies. What we don't have, and we don't do a very good job, is taking technologies and connecting them in novel ways that weren't thought about before. The interwar War I, the, uh, the British invented the tank, and they had plenty of aircraft. Beginning of World War II, the Germans used a tank in a very nonlinear tank, totally surprising the, Germ I mean the British in a way that they never thought the tank would be used. So the case study that we teach is and encapsulates this whole thing is called the liquid crystal display. And, and the reason we tell this story, and, and Undersecretary Cohen told Congress this story, is Congress says back to Undersecretary Cohen, hey, Saul, I gave you a billion dollars last year. Show me the toys. And Undersecretary Cohen goes, well, you know, we have some things, but we have some things in deep research here. 
Congress, like our kids, wants to see something really quick, like maybe in a year or two years. This story is about long-term research. In 1888, liquid crystals were discovered in Germany. Liquid crystals are typically, if you take a solid and you melt it, at that melting point, it goes right to liquid. If you continue to heat up, and then there's a fine break point. What they've discovered about liquid crystals, a liquid, solid liquid crystal, when you melt it, it hit its melting point, it would stay this gray color for about another 25 degrees, and then it would become perfectly clear. We looked, so that was invented in 1888, we discovered it. In 1962, we discovered that the rods inside the liquid part of the liquid crystals had a positive end and a negative end. RCEA was doing some experiments, and at that point in time, as you remember, in the 60s, or I remember in the 60s, we had these things called cathode ray tube TVs. RCA was ranked number one and built a lot of these things. In there, the president, Sternoff, said, I would really like to have a liquid crystal display flat screen TV by 1968 or 69. In walks a guy named George Hellmeyer, who later becomes the head of DARPA, and in his lab at RCA, they came up with the key technologies to build an LCD TV in 1968. They went on TV, they, they showed it to the world. We have liquid crystal displays, we know how to run a current through it, we know how to manipulate it, and we can do these things. But they turned all the bottles backwards so no one could see what chemicals they were using. Look at the Japanese watches and go, wow, that's really cool, because the Japanese were just at that time getting into pocket calculators, want some LCDs to put on the calculators. Here comes the big decision that we deal with in DOD and DHS, and you deal with if you work for a big company like IBM, Cisco, Intel, or something else. At that point in time, the CRTs, the royalties on them, were enormous. In fact, the British paid more royalties on RCA CRTs than they spent on building the Concord aircraft. A lot of money. So if you were Saul, and I come to Saul and I say, hey Saul, we got this new thing called LCDs, they're liquid crystals, we can do it. Saul says to, you, says to me, hey Terry, we're making all of our money off cathode ray tube TVs and we have the patent on it. So what Saul does is says, tell you what, I'm going to take the liquid crystals, we don't know a lot about them, I'm going to put you in the solid state division. So everybody at RCA knew about liquid crystals, but it, a lot of people didn't know how, outside RCA how they worked. So they put me in, in the solid state division, and I'm working now for David, and he's at IBM, I'm working for him, and David being a solid state guy goes, hey, liquid crystals are dirty, we don't want to use them. So what happens is the solid state guys in RCA eventually kill the project. The Japanese come over, formerly a company called something else, was later called Sharp, go to RCA, Saul, please give me the patent rights, please give me the capability to do LCDs, liquid crystals. Now, we're not interested. So it doesn't make our market thing, we're sitting here. So, begging him, RCA says no. The Japanese go back and they start to do research on LCD, on liquid crystals. They do re research for 15 years with no revenue, no money coming in, and tremendous cost to the company. What they do though is something else. Now Saul's the head of Sharp. Sharp forms a secret company inside Sharp. They all wear gold badges. The only, there's 15 of them. They report directly to Saul. For 15 years, they report directly to Saul. So, as they're going on, Bill, at, or David, at IBM goes, Saul, we're not getting any money out of these guys. I want to kill the project. Saul says, no, he keeps the project going. At the end of the about 15 years, they master liquid crystals. Just in serendipity now, the calculator wars kind of come out. They use them for that. They come on, and then somebody somewhere invents this thing called the laptop computer. The laptop computer now starts to use LCDs. Japanese switchly, quickly shift into their LCD technology there. They make some other breakthroughs. In 1988, they build the first 14-inch color TV using LCDs. In 2001, Sharp and both Samsung come out, and they start launching their huge 48-inch LCD TVs. A technology invented in the United States, a technology mastered almost all the things. There's a few things that RCA didn't have, but they would have got them if they would have continued. It was, everybody inside RCA knew what was happening. 
RCA gave up that technology, which is worth $100 billion a year to Far East companies. In conclusion, we have the same problem today in Homeland Security and DOD. I go to Saul, I go to Secretary Cohen. Sir, I have something here that's going to destroy the core competency of our CRT that we're using. Do you want to continue on the research on that? And what happens is we have plenty of things out there, but what they do, they destroy core competencies within our organizations. And it's a very difficult management decision, a very difficult thing to invest in when you want to invest in something that's going to kill a part of your organization. For an organization to survive and counter our enemies, we have to be like a mythical phoenix. We have to, be, we have, to have people like Undersecretary Cohen allow us to crash to the ground, kill a core competency, and emerge something else. That's why today we're at the Air Force Academy, and we have some of the 4,000 best minds in the country that use social networking in ways that I, I, I'm, my metaphor here I'm going to end on, I'm like Custer. I'm leaving the four machine guns behind because I don't know what they can do. The cadets are like the British Army in South Africa. They get it. They get something that I will probably never get to that level of doing. But they using social networking in a way that I think will lead to an enhanced defense of our country and an enhanced defense for protecting ourselves from our enemies. Because I'll tell you one thing. Our enemies know about social networking, social networking tools, and they're using them today. Thank you very much.